Hello everyone and thank you for attending today's webinar. Choosing the right platform for cloud-based virtualized managed services, sponsored by Juniper. Before we begin, I wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. On the right-hand side of your screen is the Q&A. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can type your question into the Q&A box and submit your questions to our speakers. All questions will be saved, but if we don't get to answer you, we may follow up via email. At the bottom of your audience console are multiple application widgets you can use. If you have any technical difficulties, please click on the yellow help widget. Here you can find answers to common questions. A copy of today's slide deck is available to download in the green resource list widget. Towards the end of today's presentation, we'll ask you for your feedback. A survey will pop open on your screen and will only take one minute to complete. Your feedback is extremely helpful. An on-demand version of the webcast will be available about one day after the event and can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier on today. I would now like to turn the event over to Heavy Reading's Principal Analyst, Jim Hodges. Thanks, Operator. So welcome, everybody, to today's webinar, which is entitled Choosing the Right Platform for Cloud-Based Virtualized Managed Services. I'm Jim Hodges, uh, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. So in today's session, at a high level, we're really going to be considering platform requirements, uh, some service drivers, and really kind of the best practices really required to successfully implement cloud-based virtualized managed services. It's obviously a very hot topic uh, because of a lot of the the way the industry is evolving. So we've got a very interesting presentation for you today. Um, so let me start first by introducing our speakers. We have with us uh, two speakers. So our first speaker joining us from Juniper Networks is Wayne Chung. Wayne is the Director of Product Marketing of SDN and NFV Products at Juniper Networks. Welcome, Wayne. Thank you, Jim. And we also have with us from IBM, Charlie Artega, who is the leader of IBM GTS. Uh, so basically global technology services of industry services. So welcome, Charlie. Oh, thank you. Okay, so let me go through the agenda. As I said, we're going to be covering a number of different areas as they relate to uh, virtualized managed services. So what I'm going to start off with, I'm going to start first by uh, taking a look at a number of research findings uh, from a, a study that I did, that Heavy Reading did with uh, Juniper last year that kind of looks at NFV, SD-WAN, and virtual CP drivers. So obviously these play a kind of a key role in sort of defining the scope um, of managed services. And then we're going to focus on enterprise trends and enterprise transformation, kind of the impact and the role that really the managed services really kind of plays in this transformation. And then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll hear from Charlie. He's going to present, um, provide kind of a, a view, an overview of more detail of a cloud-managed virtual CP a services solution, and it'll be kind of talking about it from a from a platform, the platform requirements, also kind of a best practices implementation perspective. And then we'll be wrapping up and taking your questions. We also will stop at some point, and we'll be uh, asking you the input, you the audience, for some input uh, uh, via a couple of poll questions. And the poll questions will be pretty much straightforward, uh, kind of related to the the concepts and and the uh, the topics that we're going to be addressing in our session today. So let me start first by kind of setting the, setting the stage and kind of setting the trends. As I said, what I want to do is provide some uh, research charts. Um, so I'm going to be providing and presenting three research charts. And this is, again, from an exclusive SD-WAN and virtual CP custom survey that Heavy Reading um, executed on behalf of Juniper Networks in 2006. So I'm going to be presenting three charts. I really started with this first chart. Uh, and the question we really wanted to address was to kind of gauge how, how much of an impact SDN was having on business operations and processes. And we did that because that's obviously kind of a, a major starting point for how NFV impacts service delivery models and also uh, the impact that that has on processes kind of also helps to sort of define the, the value proposition and kind of scope, scope of, of managed services as well. And, and, and clearly, you know, the scope of managed services is continuing to expand. But you can see here on this chart, really what we wanted to understand was just kind of the, the major impacts. And you can see that um, from, a, from an NFV perspective in a process, it really has major impacts. You start sort of with the 50% major impact. You start with security. You talk about budgeting. You talk about deployment of managed services. You talk about centralized control and policy, which is obviously kind of architecturally driven. You also talk about network resource and infrastructure planning. 
So if you look, kind of look at these sort of these four or five, it really kind of I think really kind of takes away, or really provides a, a really kind of a, I think a, a good view that you know there's really um, a major impact on a number of different processes. So these business processes are on a number of different levels, and obviously a lot of them can sort of manage. Um, sort of influence the deployment of, of managed services, which we're going to be focusing on today. And then the second chart, the second chart was, the question was really, really, really related to taking NFV and VNF and kind of understanding sort of the importance of them from a, from a company perspective in terms of uh, implementation. And, you know, I think this, this, this chart, the second chart, I think really, it really kind of provides a view of kind of how important managed services really kind of is in the context of leveraging software VNF. And we're obviously going to talk about that in more detail in, the, in, in Wayne and Charlie's presentation. But I would say, you know, based on this input, it's really clear that, that service providers really do see a strong, uh, you know, services business opportunity with, with implementing managed service. And that can be, you know, like, security services, uh, traditional communication services, SD-WAN, or even the ability to sort of customize managed service. That's kind of a an important part, but also virtual CPE. So if you look at these these rankings from virtual CPE up to security services, they're all pretty closely ranked. So, you know, to me, this really kind of shows that there's, um, I would say, a number of different opportunities, a number of different ways that the service providers can leverage managed services. So to me, that's kind of a positive thing because I think it really does kind of confirm that there is kind of a strong value proposition on a number of different levels. Obviously, Security is number one, and I think it's fair to say that over the last, I'd say, six to eight months, you know, security has become really an important uh, function of how we implement security in the cloud, and it's going to continue to be that just because obviously this kind of the whole threat landscape continues to sort of evolve and accelerate and become more complex. So, um, but again, I think this chart really, to me, kind of clarifies and sort of distills that, that you know, SD-WAN, virtual CPU are really kind of redefining managed services models. And just a note here about automation and custom customization. Um, I think that's important as well. The customization you see here, the ranking of that is important because a lot of this, as we move forward, will be to you know leverage managed services in kind of an automated environment to really kind of provide additional value and, and sort of responsiveness. Um, I'm going to move on to one more chart. Um, I included this third chart because I really wanted to understand sort of the the impacts of, of virtual CB from a revenue generation. Perspective. So we really kind of asked, you know, how you could kind of increase revenue, but also um, decrease opex, and that's obviously a major thrust of virtual CP. So I think really what's really important to me on this chart is that it really kind of clarifies that virtual CP is that you know is really an important part of being able to manage customized services. is really all about you know simplified service creation, flexible deployment models. These are all kind of, you know, very, very important to sort of the, the SD-WAN, but also the virtual CPE model as well. And again, I think these three charts kind of really kind of touch on a lot of the, the key points that we're going to be discussing kind of in more detail in the context of, of managed uh, virtual ser virtualized managed services. But also we're going to be talking about sort of the platform requirements and, and how these VNFs are hosted and how they're managed. Because that's obviously a very key part of it as well. It's not just about software. There's obviously platform requirements and, and how all these VNFs are managed and, and deployed to, to really provide value in a managed services content uh, context. So with that, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Wayne to, uh, to kind of discuss these, these sort of these services trends, these drivers, and also uh, the platform requirements in more detail. So I'll put out your first slide, Wayne, and I'll turn the presentation over to you. Okay, Jim. And I set up for really what we're going to be discussing here. So thank you everybody for taking some time in your busy day to uh, spend a few minutes for us to talk about some of our observations that we're seeing around um, cloud-based virtualized network services. So it's very important really to start with what's happening in the enterprise trends and how the cloud-based management of this can really cater to addressing those trends. And so I start off really on the left here with the trends about IT budgets, as we all know, are shrinking. But at the same time, the complexity, the, the requirements, the advancement of applications in that space is, is growing ever more. So how do you have a network that actually keeps up with those challenges at a lower cost model? And this is really where the centralized self-care management portals 
really empowering the end users with control uh, and put, being able to automate that with a uh, implementation using zero touch deployment automated throughout your end-to-end -end network. Secondly, the trends around the shift to the cloud applications, either starting in the enterprise and shifting up to the cloud, or really natively just starting up there at the get-go. And in, in that regard, we're seeing traffic patterns requiring uh, different variations of how traffic is routed. And this is where the origins around application aware routing using a hybrid-based WAN model so you can redirect traffic based on SLAs that best meet your business needs. Next is around security. As we all know, security must be thought of first today in the amount of malware and different types of attacks and the speed of that attack. Really, security can't be thought of as an after. It needs to be thought of as a full integrated package and with the ability to implement sort of different security functions as needed by the enterprise. Then around the bandwidth needs, bandwidth uh, will adapt. Uh, so having the ability for on-demand bandwidth that uh, adapts to the SLAs that are needed is really kind of critical. And so that really maps to the whole uh, virtualization to be able to spin up, spin down applications that are, or networks as needed. Uh, policies and analytics to be, be sure that they're behaving uh, as needed. And lastly, really then the control so that uh, you can then adjust or adapt as necessary. And lastly, it's around the enhanced agility. Requirements change, as we know, and that being having a network that can keep up with the agility that the business needs is really, really critical. And this is where the introduction of a UCPE, a universal CPE device out of the edge that has virtual uh, virtualization uh, capabilities to run different workloads um, across the different parts of your network allow you to keep up with the agility of the business. So those are some of the trends that we see, but let's dive into one of those specifically. And I call this the SD-WAN factor. So if you look at a typical enterprise today, really on the left here, we have branch office connected to corporate enterprise, uh, maybe connected to cloud-based applications using an MPLS-based network. We have remote offices that are uh, connected back with the corporate uh, WAN uh, using maybe an IPsec VPN to get back into the, um, you know, into the WAN highway there. And there might be an optional sort of direct connect for a better routing of uh, traffic directly to that of the, um, the, the cloud-based uh, application. And so this is very typical of the network today. But as you can see with the traffic models um, as such, there may be some non-optimal routing that exists to a cloud-based application. There may be certain types of traffic that really don't doesn't need to ride on the MPLS network. And so really this kind of introduces that whole SD-WAN factor to this. And what we're seeing is really a need to overlay uh, SD-WAN on top of that existing uh, network. So what that means is as we adopt a, a secure SD-WAN approach to the edge of your network, uh, at the branch office or even at the headquarters to take advantage of um, optimized routing over the internet so you can get to maybe a cloud-based application more directly, or you can turn up an office more rapidly, or there's other uh, major drivers that are really driving the need for SD-WAN. It's also really important to know that, well, you're going to be integrating this into an existing environment and having the ability to uh, support a hybrid-based model uh, into your MPLS network is pretty important as well. So what we're really seeing is this on the right being the model of a typical sort of managed secure SD-WAN approach. Now, what does that mean to the end user, right? Uh, just to give you a glimpse of the empowered SD-WAN user uh, leveraging this internet uh, breakout point at the, at the local branch premise, here on the top left, you'll see, um, you'll really see the um, multiple links that can exit a particular location. So in this case, we have uh, a couple uh, connections, and, uh, three there, sorry, for the 
um, fuzzy image there, but three links going out through the corporate WAN, um, some for backup, some for multi-home type of purposes. And then we have that internet breakout point. And so what we model here on the right is that internet breakout point where you can kind of see uh, what the throughput would be, what the bandwidth utilization of that is. Um, and I've expo expanded out some of those top applications. So it might be that YouTube and Facebook that are routed out the internet because I don't need that on, a, on an SLA governed uh, type of link. It may be that an Adobe-based application is uh, suited for better routing purposes, uh, shorter latency times, if it went out uh, a secured SD-WAN path. So that way, a, an office doesn't need to necessarily traverse back into the corporate WAN before they get to that uh, cloud-based application, so more direct routing. So then uh, the user will really get to see some of their link utilization, how that's behaving, um, and they can monitor across the different links here at the bottom, some of the link metrics over time, and see how uh, bandwidth is getting utilized. If maybe reroutes of traffic have occurred because of some violation of an SLA metric. So lots of different uh, control and nerve knobs really kind of really at the fingertips of the empowered user. Now this is really the the, the really you know the the bit benefit right to the end user that they are going to get. So how do we? really look at this branch transformation. Uh, offices that are really looking to gain the advantages of the software-defined approach. Uh, but then the implementation of it has really various factors associated with it. Out here on the left, we look at that legacy enterprise. Very typ you know, typical where it, it, they've had dedicated appliances that they've acquired over time. Um, connected them together, sort of in a you know sort of a chained effect here. Uh, so, you know, it's a cumbersome process because if a change is required, let's say on one box, uh, there, there might be some manual intervention that has to occur there. Uh, if a refresh occurs, um, it re really requires a manual truck roll to be able to accomplish that. So, lots of those sort of legacy challenges that they deal with. So by stitching, let's say now an SD-WAN router into this complex network, while they achieve some of the benefits that we just outlined in that SD-WAN scenario, they're still encumbered by the typical sort of truck rolls, the typical uh, integrations that have to occur with the other um, boxes that exist on the premise. So they're not necessarily gaining the benefits of a cloud-based operation in a virtualized manner. They're getting some of the elements of a software-defined approach, but they're not necessarily getting the uh, network virtual function, functions uh, benefits. So in the modernized enterprise, what we're really looking to, to gain the advantage of is obviously using one of those top use cases, like an SD-WAN, to help um, uh, you know, uh, transform the enterprise, but using that as a uh, stepping stone to kind of Look, look at modernizing that enterprise network. So in this approach on the right, what we're leveraging is a universal CPE-based platform. Uh, this platform has uh, capabilities of, of a CPE device, but in the sense that all of that function is software delivered onto the box. And secondly, um, that box also has capabilities in terms of virtual machines to execute other types of capabilities in an integrated manner. So not only do you have flexibility in the platform, you get to optimize management, you get to um, optimize the resources on that um, box so that you can leverage multiple uh, workflows on that. So in this model, things like uh, VPN, security, SD-WAN, to be loaded as VNFs onto that box. You can add on additional layers of VNFs, so maybe the WAN optimization or the wireless LAN controller. But you can also add on additional other type of enterprise-based services and applications onto it as well. So you really get to consolidate uh, those capabilities and continue to manage that um, through that uh, centralized management portal. 
with a cloud-based delivery approach. So with this, now your business can really keep up with um, a simple approach to, uh, to have enough agility to adapt to any of the changing needs going forward. And lastly, really the instantaneous delivery model so that with the click really of a mouse, uh, you can now get those operations um, automatically deployed onto your platform. So that is the modern enterprise that we're, we're talking about. So how do we best achieve something like that? First off, I, I think we need to double click really on the virtual network function for SD1 itself. So in this, I argue that having uh, an SD-WAN approach that del is delivered and packaged as a virtual network function is, is first and foremost really kind of the, 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 the way to modernize that branch office, right? So now the delivery approach of that can be harmonized with the other services on a, um, on, on a UCPE type device. And with that, the other aspects of it is if, if this VNF can actually have some of the software functions associated with the routing uh, stack that's required in the enterprise. So whether it's uh, routing internal into the network uh, and, and supporting all the various routing protocols, or it's really about the WAN uh, routing perspectives to support NPLS or, or VPNs, uh, having that built in uh, makes this deployment simpler. Then secondly, having security really built into that same VNF allows security to be thought of first, as we discussed earlier. That way, as any security needs are required, uh, they can be turned up um, instantaneously on that common VNF. And then, of course, the SD-WAN functions itself to gain you the application awareness, the, the policy-based routing, and giving you the, the monitoring and metrics to make sure that the network is behaving the way you need. Now, when all that can be integrated into a common VNF, what that does is it, it saves you some resources on that platform um, so that really it really only occupies a single virtual uh, machine on that uh, UCPE device. What that does for you then is not only gives you a nice uh, succinct package of all the core networking needs that you will need for your enterprise, but then it really opens up the platform for additional VNFs that you could layer on. So I, I represent that, that here in the green boxes, dot, 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 depending on the size of that platform, you can layer up to seven, potentially seven more additional VNFs onto that uh, particular box. And so with that, what we're seeing now is, uh, of course, the, you know, some of the other networking services uh, being delivered upon that, but also we're seeing enterprise applications such as it might be in retail, a point of sale, or in some industry where caching is required uh, some CDN function layered onto that. So the possibilities are really unbounded and it really unlocks a platform uh, for you to do a multitude of, uh, of things. So to, to be able to um, deliver upon that, I think it's important to kind of take, take a step back and look at really the, the platform, the architecture approach to be able to uh, deliver upon these uh, promises. So we talked about number one, which is the UCPE device that really will run all of these um, capabilities on, on the premise. Secondly, number two is where we get into the service management and orchestration layer that's enabled with a self-care portal. So this is the part where a lot of these network services are designed. They're the place where you can then represent that into your services catalog and offer that up to your end user to be able to select those type of services. And once they select those, then it's, the importance is to be able to automate those, the delivery of those services onto your platform, which t leads to really number three, which is where now you're, you're enabled with a true cloud delivery model of that virtual network function at the premise. So all of those things you ordered from the self-care portal are delivered onto the platform. Now, behind the scenes, number four, are some of those network service controller functions 
to make sure things really operate well from a life cycle perspective. So ongoing policies, ongoing change management, ongoing um, add, move, deletes, anything of that sort really is really managed by that network services controller and ensuring that the policies are enforced properly. And lastly, number five is if there are additional network functions that aren't really um, suited for operation maybe at the premise, what this architecture allows you to do is service chain that capability into a VNF that uh, would then live within the cloud infrastructure of the service provider. So this really unlocks a lot of options for um, additional services that can be layered on through service chain. So that's the foundations of the architecture, which Charlie will, will get into a whole lot more. So with that, really, if we look at the transform services portfolio that a service provider can, can offer and deliver to their enterprise customer, it really becomes a packaging effect of what makes sense. So I offer you an example here of maybe starting off really with like a, a basic SD-WAN service. Uh, then you can layer on things like security, so a full security approach for secure SD-WAN. Secondly, then you can add on additional network services, as we talked about WAN optimization, wireless LAN controller, and other type of things bundled in with the secure SD-WAN approach. Then with, um, as we talked about, one of the big drivers around this is cloud-based connectivity to be able to deliver this as a secured SD-WAN Cloud Connect so that customers can get, get access to their, um, to, to their Amazon Cloud or Azure Cloud or any other cloud, public or private, in an optimized and secured manner that really uh, suits those business needs and agility. So layering these packages really gives them uh, an option to choose from and gives you the service provider an option to um, differentiate their services upon. And lastly, what we're, we're starting to see is, the, is this sort of application set of services. And this is where possibilities become unbounded in the sense that per vertical, there are a multitude of applications that uh, that they would love to consolidate upon the virtual machines that reside there. And so um, this is where uh, that platform can really be uh, integrated with the rest of those network services, such that, that now what, what we're going to see is application and network really operating at sort of in, in conjunction with each, with each other and at the same speed uh, to really deliver upon the, um, the what the platform really is is designed to, uh, to build. So I'll close with this particular slide, which is, well, what is that outcome? Because at the end of the day, what we're really looking to do with this is transform the experiences that the enterprises are, are uh, looking for. So I, what we'll do is look at this across uh, five different factors um, and mapped against uh, the, the portfolio that I just outlined around basic SD-WAN to secure SD-WAN to really those other VNF services that you can layer on. From an installation perspective, at the basic SD-WAN level, um, you know, you'll, initially you'll have the uptake of having to deliver this UCPE box on-premise, but out of the box is a zero-touch provision experience. So the user prior to the delivery of the box would have gone into their self-care portal, ordered the services that they would like provision onto this box, and out of the box, it will call home essentially and um, provision all of those services in an automated way down to the box. So on, on an ongoing um, per, you know, uh, purpose, they may add other things like secure SD-WAN or those other virtual network functions and this is really sequential, meaning um, they already have the infrastructure on the premise. They then go to their self-care portal and select the services. And those services are automatically provisioned down to the UCP e-box through a cloud-based delivery model. So with this, really, the time to deploy initially may, may take hours or days just to get that box shipped and delivered um, with the zero-touch provisioning. But then every other service thereafter 
could be adopted really within minutes. So no different than ordering an application through, let's say, an app store and having it downloaded onto your device. Cost-wise, really, we're optimizing this, right? So the platform you've invested in has a long life cycle so that um, you, you, you initially um, pay for the cost of that infrastructure, but it pays for itself over time as you grow the services. Um, it's only now a software-based license that you have to adopt onto that box. Complexity of security, as we've called out, is, since this is fully integrated with a, a suite, um, the range of security is really up to you, meaning, uh, you know, initially you could have it just for the networking purposes, like a firewall, uh, or maybe next-gen firewall, but then once you get those applications layered on into it, uh, the platform will uh, be able to unlock application-level security uh, capabilities as well. Scalability is designed into this day one so that the platform will allow you to scale down to maybe just a basic SD-WAN service that you need and all the way up to all of those layered uh, VNF services as, as, um, as the business might require. So therefore, really, you know, the, the platform is layered in there such that um, scale will no, not be a concern uh, they may decide to turn it on year one, they may decide to turn it on year three, but the platform will really be there to, uh, to be able to deliver against those needs on an ongoing basis. So that gives you a, a sort of an outline of the outcomes. And uh, with that, I'm going to hand this back to you, Jim. Okay, thanks for an excellent presentation. So before we get to Charlie's presentation, we do want to stop here and uh, conduct our first poll question. The poll question is pretty straightforward. Um, you heard Wayne talk about some of these different drivers for SD-WAN implemented as a VNF. So that, that's our poll question. So what is the lead, in your, in your view, what is the lead SD-WAN as a VNF implementation driver? Is it scale? Is it lower cost to deploy? Is it simplified service introduction and shortened intervals? Or is it enhanced uh, security capabilities? So I'd ask you, the audience now, to please provide your input to us. Um, and, and, you know, Wayne, while we're waiting for the audience, um, I just want to maybe confirm one thing. So your reference architecture that you showed there, you talked about um, application-aware um, routing. Uh, and it was kind of in a hybrid WAN configuration. So I'm kind of assuming that sort of if I need to set policies to sort of support application-aware routing that um, in, this, in this hybrid config configuration, which is kind of what we're going to most – uh, service providers will define themselves in, obviously. Is that sort of managed in the network services controller? Is that kind of in that number four, uh, so the SD-WAN controller? Is that where kind of all that uh, policy gets set and managed? Is that correct? So to the end user, the self-care portal is, well built, where, is where they'll have all of those um, variables to adjust and so forth. Then once that's defined, the network services controller will take those policies and enforce them. Okay. Okay, great. So let's see what the audience said here in terms of their input. Okay, so 60% um, simplified service introduction for an interval, 60%, then it was lower cost to deploy, then it was scale, and then it was security. I'm a little surprised security is a little bit low, but uh, I think it's, it's one of these things we're still trying to figure out, I think, in the industry, what security requirements are required. We know we need more in the cloud and with FD-WAN. But are there any sort of surprises from your perspective here? I would say the same thing. Security probably, I would say, is uh, I, I would think it would be higher as well. Okay. But obviously, sort of the uh, the obviously when you talk to your customers, obviously the service introduction and intervals are kind of a key part. Yeah, that keeping up with the pace of the cloud is exactly why most are looking at this. Right. Okay. Okay, with that, so we're now going to move on to the second part of our presentation. So in the second half of this presentation, we're going to really kind of kind of focus on the considerations and the benefits associated with implementing managed services. So we're going to be using virtual CP as a managed services kind of, and look at how, based on sort of the platform that Wayne presented, how it can be used, how virtual CP can be used to provide, uh, um, you know, sort of tangible benefits uh, and really kind of drive a lot of um, flexibility in commercial deployments. And Charlie's going to be 
uh, drilling down on this and presenting. So, Chart, I'm going to push out your first slide, and I'm going to turn the presentation over to you to, uh, to discuss virtual CP in a managed services and platform context. So, please go ahead. Thank you, Jim, and welcome, everyone. Um, so, the uh, thing we're seeing in the industry is uh, service providers are at different stages in the evolution uh, to move to a uh, network function virtualization environment. So um, many uh, providers uh, are still in the early stages. So you know, of course, the legacy environment, as we call it, uh, would be appliance-based, uh, hardware-based uh, solutions that are very fixed in, in terms of scaling and um, functionality, uh, flexibility. Uh, we're starting to see, of course, the movement to uh, virtualizing these functions on a software-based platform um, in stage one. But uh, stage two is really where you start uh, taking advantage of um, a lot of uh, functionality uh, in terms of automation and orchestration that really drives benefits and uh, starts reducing the OPEX, the operational costs, significantly. Uh, of course, it's cloud-based uh, native network functions that make uh, a lot of this uh, more effective. And uh, there's a concept that we call factory approach, uh, where you uh, start uh, being able to uh, deploy this in a uh, standard way in multiple regions of the provider or countries, whatever the case may be. So uh, with the factory approach, uh, obviously, you have highly standardized uh, uh, methods and, and uh, ways to deploy this. All right. So in the um, space of the use cases, uh, in discussion about use cases, uh, operators are looking at some uh, key use cases. Uh, of course, there's others. This is the sampling of uh, one of the, some of the main ones that we see. Uh, SD-WAN obviously is, seems to be on top of the list among others. Um, of course, uh, the uh, WAN accelerator capability has been there a while in a appliance-based uh, solution and now you know, moving to virtualized uh, capability. Of course, uh, what I want to focus on for the next few minutes is the virtual CPE. So we're already seeing some operators like AT&T rolling out uh, capabilities in that space, and there's other operators um, focused on similar efforts in the market. So how uh, can communication providers move quickly into the virtualized world uh, without having to transform the entire operation. Um, it's obviously challenging to move from a legacy environment to a fully SD-WAN NFE-enabled environment. Uh, there's a lot of changes, um, transformation, if you will, that has to occur. And that's not an easy thing that can happen overnight. It takes many months, maybe even years, to get to that. So the um, challenge is obviously how uh, can some of this done, be done quickly without uh, changing the whole, whole infrastructure. Um, by looking on the left side, uh, similar to what uh, Wayne talked about a minute ago, is we have the legacy environment um, with uh, appliance-based uh, solutions. And on the right side is where the new, the new world, the modern branch, um, is where we have a single platform that is virtualized uh, that we can have multiple network functions running on routing, firewall, other um, WAN optimization, and uh, many other uh, functions that may be appropriate for a particular uh, customer or site. So there's obviously a uh, ability to automate things and um, use zero-touch provisioning in the provisioning process to accelerate uh, a lot of the deployments and um, provide a richness of features and capabilities that before it was difficult to achieve with the appliance-based solutions. So in the recent months, IBM has uh, come out with a new offering uh, called uh, Cloud Managed uh, Virtualized CPE service that uh, we're uh, offering to our service providers uh, to help them move quickly to a uh, managed or a ability to run uh, virtualized services and then provide that to their customers. So um, here we have the enterprise branch on the left. Um, there's, of course, the 
service provider infrastructure in the blue box there that uh, stays the same. You know, the relationship uh, with the customers is still with the service provider uh, and, of course, service level agreements and so on. But then IBM provides as an overlay uh, the support and functionality in the cloud to help deploy these um, virtualized platforms quickly. Um, we have, of course, the orchestration capability and so on that we tie in with our uh, tooling that we use for many other cloud services that we provide today already. So this is uh, moving to a DevOps automation type of platform. Uh, so quickly uh, enhance functionality and add new services uh, You know, constantly. There's new uh, virtual network functions that are being introduced in the market, and some of them are interesting to a broader audience. Some are fairly narrow in scope uh, and, and who they can provide services to. So the capability uh, to have a environment that can be quickly updated and, and introduce new services becomes very interesting. Uh, of course, as Wayne talked about already, the back-end piece uh, from a connectivity perspective and adding other services to this environment uh, becomes very interesting once you have uh, the appropriate uh, uh, capability in place. You can connect to cloud services from Amazon, Google, and others, um, and as well as many other services, uh, security services that uh, are obviously very important nowadays so with all the breaches that we're seeing. So um, lots of different things can be done here uh, once once you have the basic ingredients of the uh, virtual CPE in place. So in diving down a little bit deeper, what's initially included? So this is, um, of course, from a catalog perspective, uh, the basic functionality um, of routing and firewall functions. We have SD-WAN and WAN optimization, and then uh, we're also uh, starting to provide uh, various security functions, IPS, IDS, as well as um, other you know, managed um, security functions to monitor uh, threats and attacks and things like that, as well as active uh, virus uh, protection and scanning. So lots of security functions. Um, they can be uh, invoked as, as needed, uh, so customers can choose the functions they want. Uh, again, the platform, the whole concept here is that it's very flexible allows uh, many different uh, combinations of services uh, suited to particular customer needs. Uh, of course, as Wayne already mentioned, uh, it's, it's key that the customer, the end customer, can start provisioning uh, a lot of these services through the self-service portal. Uh, it takes a workload away from the service provider, and, and of course, the end effect is that the overhead uh, to deliver those services is reduced, as well as the um, ability to turn uh, from turn it from the request to implementation, the, sh the time to do that is, is reduced significantly. Um, in in the uh, I want to highlight one thing is from a hub perspective. Uh, there's a little box there on the bottom of the chart. Um, that's really where a lot of things come together. This would be like an Equinix or some kind of colo where other services exist, and once you have this in place, uh, the service you can quickly enable a bunch of uh, different services from many providers that are present at those colo sites. So the beauty here is, you know, once you have the basic infrastructure there, it can happen very quickly. So from a cloud uh, managed perspective, IBM. Uh, is helping uh, providers to get up to speed quickly as an overlay service, as I mentioned. Uh, the idea is that we shorten the time to market. Uh, we have all these different functions fully integrated, tested, running in our cloud uh, that can uh, spin up very quickly for service providers. Um, the idea is that um, not only do we provide the provisioning, but we also provide ongoing ma uh, management and uh, involvement of the uh, functionality, The the um, different uh, new functions and, and services that are required and help providers to to move this uh, capability continuously to enhance it and, and add additional functionality. Uh, so, of course, in, in the first phase that we're rolling out, we have some of the key uh, 
functions that we already mentioned, uh, zero-touch provisioning, firewall, uh, SD-WAN, and uh, WAN optimization. And of course, as we grow the uh, platform of services, there will be many other functions. Uh, some of them are not so obvious today, but uh, you know the, they kind of go outside the traditional network functionality that we're used to. Uh, and some of them, as, as Wayne mentioned, they are you know more business centric functions that uh, are starting to come into play here. So quite an interesting uh, set of developments in the industry. So um, we're introducing this as a service model similar to what uh, we're seeing in the industry, the uh, cloud-based services that have been around for a few years. Um, everyone is expecting similar type services. Many of the um, larger enterprises, even smaller enterprises, want to procure a service and then be able to change it quickly. So this whole concept of as a service is uh, reflected here in this capability as well. Um, it allows uh, flexibility that really hasn't been there in the past to change services, to uh, invoke new services, to cancel services that are not so interesting or not needed anymore. So it gives a customer a very dynamic platform that they can uh, select what's best for their business. So we see many cases customers have a, um, a shrinking a business or expanding business and they want to scale up quickly and also be able to scale down if needed uh, depending on, on the type of industry they're in. So the idea here is again faster time to market. Um, we see this as an overlay service so it's uh, non-intrusive to the service provider from an infrastructure perspective. It allows um, the ability to quickly roll this out um, and, and uh, offer that to service provider customers. Um, it's a uh, pure OPEX model, so no CAPEX required up front. Uh, and there's a concept of evergreen technology here that allows, uh, of course, on the software side, the uh, functions can be updated uh, frequently, and they are uh, constantly being updated, in, as we're seeing with the uh, various uh, industry players there. So the um, ability to quickly provision and deprovision Services uh, is, a, is is there. It, uh, a lot of this can be invoked by the end customer itself. Of course, the process uh, behind it is all the automation that makes this happen, and that's really the key thing here that uh, helps reduce the costs, right? The automation, automation in the environment uh, that makes a lot of this uh, reduce the overhead of uh, humans to to touch the infrastructure. Um, for me. Um, other perspective, uh, if customers have uh, moving uh, requirements or changing requirements in terms of their sites, if they want to roll out new sites, those kind of things can be done very quickly. Uh, there's different technologies, obviously, depending on the uh, last mile technology that uh, may uh, slow that down, but other than that, it, it can be done very quickly. Um, so the Again, the cost here is you know, highly optimized for a, a very dynamic environment. Uh, the DevOps concept that I mentioned before is, is fully here. You know, the service providers can come up with new services, uh, decide what they are interested in, and uh, offer that to their customers on a very short notice. So the whole cycle from development to operations is shortened significantly from traditional approach. So the managed uh, CPE service that we're providing um, integrates easily into the existing network and security environments. Um, of course, on the back end side, the integration with the OSS systems and so on uh, has to be done. So the, uh, the delivery is seamless for the end customer. Uh, that does require a little bit of work. Uh, it's not trivial, but uh, certainly uh, the ability to um, have a new service rolled out quickly and have the flexibility uh, to take this in-house down the road when the service provider uh, is ready to do that um, is, is there, of course. Uh, and 
in addition, you know, the customers uh, want to see what's going on in the network, the ability to see what's going on in their infrastructure. Uh, so this platform, of course, provides that capability as well. So just to wrap things up, um, we are um, introducing a new integration point uh, for the platform very soon. Uh, it's around the Agile Service Manager that IBM has recently introduced. So Agile Service Manager is an evolution of the NetCool platform uh, that keeps track of the topology changes in build time. Of course, in SDN, in the SDN world, you have changes occurring constantly, and you want to be able to have visibility of that in real time. So the platform here is uh, able to track and, and, and uh, keep up with all the res uh, the changes in the uh, SDN world, the SDN uh, network, as well as the legacy network. So you can keep track of both now. So this is uh, quite interesting, and this capability will be introduced in the next couple of months. Okay, and with that, I will pass it back to Jim for okay. the conclusion. Great. Thanks, Charlie. So we're going to wrap up and take some questions now. Again, thanks, Charlie. It's a very interesting presentation. It's always nice to see kind of reference architectures actually implemented and and uh, and actually uh, sort of integrated into the network. So we're going to get to Q&A, but before we do that, we want to stop and um, conduct our second and final poll question. This one is virtual CP related, and it's kind of similar to the first one. We're looking for your view on what do you think is the is the lead virtual CP as a service implementation driver? Is it is it scale? Is it kind of avoiding the refresh cycle churn that Charlie talked about? Is it assured interworking? Is it lower cost and sh to be able to shift capex opex? Is it simplified integration of other platforms? So we're going to um, we're going to ask you the audience now. To please provide your input. But while we're here. Um, while we're here, we're going to also ask. Uh, we're also going to take some questions from uh, from the audience. So there's a number of questions I'm going to ask. One is um, I'll start with kind of the first one. I'll kind of paraphrase it, and uh, either Wayne or Charlie jump in here. Uh, the question says basically, kind of curious about MDM, so mobile device management. Uh, kind of what's built in for managing enterprise mobile device management. I guess including threat management for mobile in the enterprise wireless network and, and kind of when, when devices are kind of, I guess, running on different networks like public LT or Wi-Fi. So, Wayne, did you want to start first with this one? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, I, I, you know, natively in terms of uh, what we've talked about, uh, MDM is, wasn't really necessarily part of it, but that, that is exactly kind of the principles of this open architecture is that, uh, those type of services can be built in uh, into this platform. Uh, so, you know, if you have an MDM software uh, vendor of choice, uh, the platform is intended to be very open so that third-party things can be developed in that sort of DevOps-based manner that Charlie has talked about. Okay. And so that's really kind of the idea. And with security, you know, if you if you want to manage some of the security elements of that, then you can leverage the um, the advanced security portfolio, the unified threat management portfolio that's in um, the virtual SRX to uh, to apply things like content filtering or antivirus or anything like that uh, into you know managing those MTM devices. Okay, Charlie, do you want to add anything to yeah. this? Yeah, so, so real quick, um, so currently we don't have the MDM uh, functionality in, integrated here in this platform, but uh, it's very easily done. We have a complete set of offerings around MDM that uh, we are using internally for our employees as well as externally for other clients, um, so that can be very easily done. Uh, again, it's about the hub uh, you know, point where, where things come together in the hub or the data center, the uh, co-location site, uh, so we can easily introduce those services. Um, it's the first time I got this question from anyone, so it's a good question. Thank you. Uh, we'd be happy to discuss that further. You know, but uh, we, It's, again, very easy to do that um, at the hub point, so we can introduce those uh, services there. Thanks, Charlie. We could probably do a whole webinar just on that. It's, gonna be, it's becoming that uh, important a topic. Okay, so this is the input from the audience. So actually, pretty well, pretty even balance. 
so what's the lead driver? So I think the top one a little bit ahead uh, it was simplified integration of other platforms, and then it was avoiding re uh, refresh cycle churn you talked about, and then lower uh, cost and shifting capex opex. No, well, scale and then capex, and then uh, assured interworking. I guess really quickly, Charlie, any sort of surprises here from your perspective? No, I I kind of expect that. I mean, there's yeah. different viewpoints on on that. So yeah, it's really it's actually, yeah, balanced. it's actually pretty well aligned with the chart I put up from the research we showed that showed there were a number of different drivers. Okay, we're going to get to some more questions, but I just wanted to um, also let the audience know that if you're looking for more information related to uh, kind of the kind of topics we're talking about today, uh, Light Reading and is having its NFV and Carrier SDN event next week in Denver, so I've got some information there, and Juniper and IBM are going to be uh, providing demos and, and uh, being on uh, different panels and things like that. So I'll just leave this up here. Uh, if you find yourself in the Denver area, we'd love to uh, just to see you. And I'll be uh, doing a couple of panels related to uh, some related topics as well. But let me see if we can get to a couple more questions here. Um, so this question is, it kind of goes back, I think, and maybe either it will sort of to both of you. Uh, how do you intend to extend network segments from cloud onto enterprise branches? Wayne, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll take a, I'll take a uh, swing at that. Um, yeah, and I think that's really kind of where integrations as a whole, if I um, extract that question, right, is, is really important because much of this is about making sure that existing environments, whether it's about the network segments or whether it's some other type of integration need, that is really kind of some of the complexities when they're dealing with the real-world implementations of this. And so we founded our, you know, implementations really at the branch level based on June OS um, as an operating system. And so much of the same principles that you would have uh, in the traditional appliance-based world, right, would, uh, would be there in the virtualized world. And so network segmentation of that sort, you know, uh, you know we, we, we bring on things like VLANs to tagging to mapping those to, um, you know, different VRFs in the network. So all of those, you know, traditional principles that you have for network segmentation um, that you may have used in the past would still uh, okay. be at your toolkit here in the virtualized world. So the same concepts apply, basically. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, just just a, before I get to you, Charlie, just as we said at the beginning of the session, uh, we just pushed out a uh, survey link for you to provide input on today's session that will help us provide uh, uh, content for future sessions. So if you could uh, please complete the survey now, we, we'd really appreciate it. Um, so maybe we'll go to one more uh, one more question. This one is, um, and it, it's kind of, maybe it's kind of related to my question about application awareness. It says, with application awareness, I believe local internet breakout can happen at the CP device itself, especially for things like guest Wi-Fi or applications like over-the-top applications like YouTube. Is that is that a possibility? Yeah, so very much so. So, um, and this is where the empowerment of the end user becomes very important because you know policies can change on a dime, or a new application might be needed and a new policy needs to be introduced. So this is where having that self-care portal, having those right. uh, policy definitions at the fingertips of the end user. Um, so once they actually push, you know, uh, build up those policies. Uh, then those po the enforcement of those policy policies are pushed really at to our um, you know to our network services controller which manages it across the end-to-end -end network and then every single facility that's part of the group that needs to adopt that policy would um, would be able to instantaneously uh, enforce those rule sets and from a monitoring perspective you know to be, make sure that the behavior of the application is uh, matching your network needs, continual telemetry of that occurs. And if a policy needs to be changed because an application isn't um, working the way you intended it to, again, the, the same you know uh, process would take um, place again. So uh, this is where now the network really can keep up with the speed of the cloud and the applications. Okay. okay it's a great question for that. Yeah, Charlie, do you want to add something here? 
No, I think Wayne covered it pretty well. But I, yeah, there's incredible flexibility. And just to, for clarification, when we say end user, we mean the end, the administrator of the end customer, not necessarily the individual user at the desk, right, that uh, would want to change a policy. So you obviously don't want to give rights to those folks. That might be a problem. So you want to enable the you know enterprise of the customer that's uh, consuming the service from the provider to make changes. Especially they're not the same, especially they're not, they're not the right end user in terms of identity. Okay, so there was one other question here, and um, we may get back to after the webinar, but it was related to sort of, again, uh, unified threat management built into security. I think we pretty much talked about that for endpoint security, um, but we'll we'll take a look at it after the event we make it back to. But anyway, I think we're going to have to wrap it up there. So uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Wayne and Charlie for uh, stepping up today and providing us these presentations, provide, I think, a really excellent kind of hands-on technical view of where we are and sort of the value proposition for managed services in kind of an SD-WAN and, and virtual CP context. And I'd also like to thank you, the audience, for attending our session today and participating in our polls. And uh, so for light reading, this is Jim Hodges. Again, I'd like to thank the audience for attending, and we hope to see you again at future webinars. Thank you. <laughs>